The enormous flow of refugees making its way from the Middle East and Africa has revealed serious cracks in the European Union. On this issue, the Union is far from united. Latest estimates suggest as many as 850,000 migrants will try to find a new home there this year, in the largest movement of refugees since World War II. To help us understand the risks and the opportunities facing Europe, we welcome, in Hamburg, Germany, via Skype, Josef Joffe, editor of Die Zeit and professor of political science at Stanford University. In London, UK, Lars Tregord, historian at Erste Schundel University College in Stockholm, Sweden, and visiting professor at the London School of Economics. In New York, New York, Ivan Krastyev, chairman of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia, Bulgaria, and permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna, Austria. And with us here in studio, Fezi Baban, who teaches international development studies and political studies in those departments at Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario. And it is good to welcome this all-star panel to our program tonight. Fezi, I want to start with you because you spent the summer uh, over there in Turkey and Greece doing studies for your research on the refugees. Let's start with this. What made so many people believe that Europe was open to receiving refugees in such large numbers to begin with? Well, I think when you look at on the ground, it's not that actually they believe that the Europe is uh, open to refugees, but there's a de desperate situation. And uh, many of those, or at least you know, the two million refugees in Turkey, they're from Syria, and they're fleeing uh, from the war, in the civil war, and they're in a limbo situation in, uh, in Turkey. They're under uh, what Turkish government calls a temporary protection uh, status, which doesn't grant them a refugee status, uh, gives them some limited rights. Uh, but because of the limbo situation, the UNHCR doesn't register uh, them as refugees. So they try to get to Europe with the hope that they can establish a safer and more uh, stable uh, life. So what made them think, though, that Europe had an open door policy and it was come on in, we're available to you. Mm -hmm. Again, as I said, I don't think that's how they think on the ground. It's saying that, well, you know, the Europe is going to open arms and we're going there or they will accept us. Uh, but they try to get to a place where they can establish lives. But on the other hand, of course, that they know, some of them at least, uh, know that the Europe has a refugee policy. Hmm. Because the problem is that the Turkey uh, is a signatory to, um, to the 1951 Refugee Convention, but it has a geographical limitation. So it does not accept refugees from the east. It accepts refugees from Europe if they come, but from west, from east, if you're coming from places like Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, you cannot claim a refugee status in Turkey, whereas you can in Europe. So that's why they try to get to Europe. Lars, let me go to you with a follow-up, and that is the uh, Prime Minister of Hungary has said these people, for the, the vast majority of them, aren't real refugees. They're just people seeking a better life, better economic circumstances. Is that a distinction worth making? Well, yes and no. In in uh, in formal legal terms, of course, the um, European policies uh, make allowances uh, for uh, uh, refugees, uh, uh, migrants that have official refugee status in a way they wouldn't for, let's say, an ordinary uh, labor uh, migrant. But uh, for practical purposes, of course, many uh, of these people uh, are simultaneously both. So it's a question of whether you look at it sort of empirically on the ground as human beings or if you understand the legal categories that, that apply in different ways uh, in, in the context of uh, the, the EU. Let's just put up a couple of charts right now to show everybody where they're coming from and where they're going to. Uh, and admittedly, these are 2014 numbers, so don't include the latest waves uh, of human beings. But uh, with nobody's surprise, Syria is the number one country by far as the place where refugees are coming from, Afghanistan, Kosovo, Eritrea, and Serbia, as we go down the list. And where are they going to, overwhelmingly? Germany, Sweden, France, Italy, Switzerland, and then the UK. Uh, Josef, the president of the European Commission, is calling on member states to accept 160,000 migrants through a quota system. There's also talk of upwards of 800,000 refugees reaching Europe this year. Now, initially, Angela Merkel was receiving a lot of plaudits for opening the door and saying, this is what the new Germany is all about. Now, we're not so sure. Is the we can do it no longer doable in your view? Well, she just reaffirmed the point. We can do it and we will do it. But it's not, a, it's not up to her. Uh, 
the 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 reason why this flow is going to continue, even though there's a, attempts being made to close the German border, the German Austrian border is that Germany has the most liberal asylum law, and all you have to do literally is to say the magic word as you come in, asylum. Then they have to take you in, and then they have to start reprocessing you which until now has taken about an average of about five, uh, five months. By that time, your children are in school, maybe you have a job, and it's going to be very hard to deport, deport them the way the United States is not very successfully deport, deporting them. So add to the most liberal asylum law that Germany is the promised land, meaning it is the richest, it has full employment, it has the most generous welfare state, which doesn't distinguish between foreigners and Germans. And obviously, Germany is the place to go. And whatever uh, attempts are being made to seal borders, uh, the flow is going to continue because they're not sealing the borders. They're just spot checking. And the moment you say asylum, they have to let you in. Joseph, let me do this follow up. And that is, given the Given the massive flood of uh, asylum seekers to Germany in recent months, what do the most recent public opinions there say about whether the average German citizen is still supportive of this? Um, the the public opinion figures that I know, but they, I don't ha have them, you know, for the last several days, but so over the last weeks, are nothing short of miraculous. Uh, the, very welcoming. Uh, uh, there is a, a vast majority of Germans asking for more protection uh, against violence, against, against asylum seekers. And the majority also uh, does not say, let's not, ha let's not give them monetary handouts. Uh, they deserve it. So at this point, uh, the arms are still open. They haven't turned into, into, into clenched fists. It has, there is an explanation because the brunt of, uh, of, of, of the inflow is being taken by the city of Munich, which is closest to the Austrian border. And I was just there and I was flabbergasted. I was amazed how efficiently the Munich authorities have been coping with you know, the arrival of five, eight to 8,000 per night, per night. So at this point, there is no overload. I'm th but I'm stressing at this point. Understood. Ivan Krastev, let me bring you in. You've, you may have heard others refer to what's happening right now in Germany as uh, the hippie state or the new Jerusalem, or it's going through its Princess Diana moment, meaning it's all emotion without any rational restraint. What do you think of those observations? Listen, I do believe and I very much agree that this is true for Germany. This is true even for Austria. Uh, the public opinion was much more open to the refugees than many people expected. Uh, and I do believe that the politicians which uh, initially reacted and believing that anti-refugee and anti-migrant sentiments are going to be very strong, they have been surprised. The problem is how long this type of an emotional commitment is going to stay. And this is going very much to depend on the efficiency of the state. Uh, to deal with them, basically to find place for them, and also give a long-term vision. Because the interesting story is, when you talk about refugees, also you have in mind people who are coming from a place to which they'll be very happy to go back if this place is going to change. And don't forget, this happened with many people. After the Kosovo crisis, there was almost one million people that went to Macedonia and uh, to Albania and big number, 900,000 of these people were back. Uh, so the problem with the crisis is that you have the refugees, but many people don't know what is going to happen in places like Syria. So you don't know how to look at them as the visitors who are coming for a while or people who are going to stay forever. Hmm. Lars, having said that, I, I did see a quote the other day, and perhaps you could tell me how widespread you believe this sentiment to be. I heard somebody say, we need these people. They're going to pay for my pension in the years to come. How, how many people do you think believe that because Europeans aren't replacing themselves in terms of the birth rate, that this will take care of their future financially? <clears throat> oh, I think that is mostly an argument uh, made by, uh, by some academics or economists. And I'm not saying it's, it's incorrect, but I think that what, 
drives support for refugees in, in a country like Sweden right now is much the same as what you see in, in Germany. It comes from uh, some kind of moral uh, position. On the other hand, the resistance, which is all also there, I mean, what we see in Sweden uh, are polls that on the one hand confirm what we heard from Joseph about Germany, that is to say, rising support uh, for refugees. On the other hand, we also have a, a uptick for the Sweden Democrats, we, the Swedish party that's against immigration. So there is a kind of a split in the population. And those who are against are driven also not by these kinds of um, uh, rational economic arguments, but uh, uh, more fears about uh, you know, losing um, cohesion in a nation and uh, uh, that it will cost too much and so forth. But it's primarily more of a xenophobic, I think, instinct on the one hand, and one that you know, comes from a, the sort of the opposite moral position on the other. Uh, so that's how I would uh, view it at this point, at least. Lars, let me do a follow-up with you on that. Help us understand this, because in Sweden, it is the anti-immigrant party, the Sweden Democrats, not the Social Democrats, but the Sweden Democrats, that are polling at number one, the anti-immigrant party, in the place where supposedly the immigrants are most welcome. Help us understand that. Uh, yeah, first of all, that is not a correct uh, number. I mean, I, I saw the most recent polls yesterday, and uh, Sweden Democrats are strong, but they are in, in a third position. Uh, but, you know, I don't mean to minimize it, but uh, uh, it's not, certainly not the, the biggest party in the polls. 26.5% uh, I'm said, hearing. Yeah, no, that's, that's you know, there are different the polling uh, bureaus, but the, the ones that are the more credible ones have them at around 20%. But we don't need to quibble with the numbers. The you know, point, of course, is that Sweden Democrats uh, have been rising. And I think, from my point of view, the big conundrum right now for many of the parties, particularly the Social Democrats, but the parties on the left in general, is that they used to be the parties that stood for what we can think about national community. Um, they were able, especially in the 1930s and 40s, critical decades in Europe, uh, to develop what we can think of as a left-wing nationalism, uh, where solidarity, equality, freedom, these slogans from the French Revolution were associated with social democrats. Today, the left in Sweden and many other countries in Europe is split between a toward traditional side uh, represented often by the mass base of the party that still believes very much in the nation state and a politics of solidarity within the nation. But then you also have uh, the, the, the ones, the cultural left, who tend to now prefer the language of human rights, of internationalism, uh, and even open borders. Uh, and that, I think, has created confusion, particularly among the social democrats. The Swedish, the Swedish Sweden Democrats are very similar to the Social Democrats in their, um, you know, positive view of the welfare state. It's just that they like to keep it, you know, as a, a strictly Swedish national concern, and they are they are very suspicious of too much immigration uh, for that reason. Ivan Krastev, let let's uh, begin a bit of a comparison between how Western Europe has responded versus Eastern Europe. Uh, we just heard Josef Joffi talk about how Germany has responded with open arms. Eastern Europe, they tend to be putting up fences and making things more difficult. Uh, you said, I think the response to the refugees uh, in your New York Times piece was, we were promised tourists, not refugees. What do you think of Eastern Europe's response to this crisis? Uh, there was a really contrasting difference. And this is on the level of government, but it's even in my view more important on the level of public opinion. In Germany, you're going to see the majority of the people really showing a huge compassion with the people coming from uh, uh, this uh, crisis. Why in most of our countries, and don't forget our countries are much more transit countries, there are not many who want to stay in places like Bulgaria or Hungary. There was an overwhelming majority of people who believed that we should close the borders. And basically, if the open borders 25 years ago have been perceived as the best thing that happened to us, now they're coming as a big threat. There's several explanations for this. One is that you're talking about the small nations, quite provincial, not much interested what is happening in the world. And for us, this very fact that we're not going to live simply in Europe, but we're going to live in a world came as a surprise. Also, we are talking about the nations with the major demographic programs, problems. For example, my own country, Bulgaria, if the UN uh, projections are right, in the next 25 years is going to lose 27% of the population. So you have this huge demographic fear 
in which you have these young people who come and you don't know how to do this. You're afraid that you're not going to leave your country, but you're going to live in a different country. And of course, the Islamic factor is very important in many of these countries. Don't forget some of these countries is, is, used to be part of the Ottoman Empire. So all our kind of a national identity was very much based on this. Uh, so this is a very difficult situation because also I do believe it's going to have some institutional consequences for the European Union itself. Because uh, it's not simply, as I said, the publics, but also the governments, which are now strongly opposing any redistribution of refugees across the European Union. And this is going to put, in my view, a very huge problem in the relations between Central and Eastern Europe and Germany, which were critically important uh, uh, for the whole process of transition. My feeling is, I don't know, uh, is Professor Joffe is going to agree that Germany slightly felt betrayed because uh, in many other crises, including the Ukrainian crisis, Germany had the feeling that it very much responded to the demand of Central and Eastern Europe, and now it had the feeling that basically Central and Eastern Europeans are only about themselves. Josef Joffi, can I get you to comment on that? Back, back in Munich, which is, which is the main arrival point, the Bavarians feel betrayed by the rest of Germany, the other German states, who, uh, which are not taking in uh, uh, refugees, they're only taking in by the hundreds, rather than by the thousands. So the conflict is within as well as between between societies. And the problem on German, for Germany is that it is the promised land for the reasons uh, I already outlined. It's easy to get in. It's easy to stay. It's um, it, uh, In Germany, there are about 600,000 jobs that go begging. So there is there's also a crass economic need for immigration. Um, the problem I think we haven't talked about is this. Given the, given the onslaught, the tsunami, say, take Munich, where I talked to the mayor the other day, I said, how come you got them out of the train station so quickly? I, I don't see a trace of any refugees there. He says, well, we didn't have the time and the, and the tools to register them. So we don't even know who's coming in. Now, I don't, you don't have to be a right-wing reactionary to assume that with the flow will also come people who have less than good intentions, uh, Islamists, ISIS people. And my fear is that um, is, is, is the next inside attack, terror attack, inside Germany by, for instance, people who came in under the cover of refugees. And that, I think, may turn the mood very, very quickly. Uh, Faisi, I need to ask you, since you were just over there, how accurate do you think the fear is that somehow ISIS is using this movement of hundreds of thousands of people to infiltrate the West? Yeah. Well, I mean, at least what I see on the ground in, um, you know, in Turkey, I didn't get the sense from the people in the region that the ISIS, ISIS has specific plans you know, to use the flow. But, I think there is an important point here, as Professor Yoffe says, is that the controlling the flow is important in terms of identifying who is coming, who is the refugee, who is not the refugee. And that's precisely the reason why the European Union has to um, register them at the source and in Turkey, in Jordan, in Lebanon, in places where these refugees are trying to uh, register themselves as refugees, but they cannot. And when you do it on the ground, you actually quickly find out who is who. Uh, NGOs on the ground. I can tell, for instance, in Gaziantep, when you talk to NGOs, they'll tell you right away who is who, who is ISIS, who is doing what. There is that kind of expertise. Mm -hmm. So the European Union actually can very easily screen and, and identify uh, these type of uh, situations. But that also eliminates the dangerous sea crossings as well, because part of the reason why people are taking these perilous journeys is that because there's no uh, official registration process, they're trying to get to Europe. But if you register them at the source and do it in a systematic manner, in cooperation with the local authorities, then you control the flow, you identify uh, who the refugees are, and, and, and have a much better situation, both for receiving countries, but also for refugees as well. The great promise of Europe, though, or one of the great promises of Europe was you, you come and you can come to any country in the EU and you have freedom of movement to go among all the countries that are yeah. a part of it. Do, do you think we are going to get to a stage where that's not going to be the case for these migrants, that they are going to be told, okay, you want in, you've got to live here? 
Well, I mean, the thing is that the Dublin protocols, which you know, try to establish that, because if we look at the Dublin protocol, and that's part of the EU's asylum uh, policy, is that it, it stipulates that you actually register in the country where you, know, you enter, and then the, the application process is handled there. And once you get the process, you can, of course, move around. But the Dublin protocol now is effectively uh, suspended. It doesn't work because that system collapsed in Italy, in, uh, in, uh, in Greece. And then the Schengen now is suspended, uh, at least for temporarily, because the Germany and Austria cannot deal with the flow, so that the Schengen borders are, um, are closed. So you may be right in the long run uh, in terms of how these uh, refugees are going to be relocated, but it will be very hard to do that. Uh, without overhauling the entire EU asylum system hmm. because there are some rules and regulations in place. Let's share some more numbers here as we try to get a handle on, I suspect, what one of the most important questions is here, and that is how well will these refugees eventually manage to create a life for themselves in their new countries and integrate into European society? And to that end, the number of Muslims in Europe has grown from almost 30 million in 1990 to 44 million in the year 2010. Europe's Muslim population is projected to exceed 58 million by 2030. And in terms of individual countries, here's how it breaks down. Austria, from 2010 to 2030, we're looking at nearly a doubling. In Denmark, up a bit. In Germany, up a couple of points. In Sweden, virtually doubled. In the UK, virtually doubled. And in Bulgaria, up a couple of points. By comparison, in the United States, less than 1% in 2010 anticipated to be 1.7% in 2030, and in Canada, 2.8% trending towards 6.6%. This, of course, is Pew Research from a few years ago. Given the current wave of population, these percentages could all be higher going forward. Let's look at the integration efforts. Lars, you know Sweden very well. What, um, what mark would you give Sweden's efforts in terms of integrating its new Muslim population into the broader population? There are some serious problems, it's clear. Um, we, we have a situation in Sweden where the, the way into Swedish society is really uh, through, through work, through employment. Uh, Sweden has, has very, very high uh, rates when it comes to, to labor market participation, uh, much, much higher than the European uh, average, and that applies to both men and women. Uh, their gender equality is very, very important here. And here, we, of course, we see that uh, the immigrants coming, especially those who are coming uh, that are refugees. Sweden stands out by having a much larger proportion of refugee you know, immigrants re relative to labor immigrants. And many of them are outside of the labor market. And if you're outside of the labor market, that usually is associated with segregation when it comes to housing and an isolation from right, the Swedish population at large. So I, I would say that this here uh, is the key challenge. And this comes at a time uh, when we, as opposed to Germany in Sweden, see right, relatively high unemployment rates that hit also young people in Sweden who, are, who grew up there. Uh, so it is a very bad moment to have very, very large volumes of migrants coming in uh, with relatively low skills as far as participation in a, in a very sophisticated labor market. Uh, there are not that many entry-level jobs, uh, particularly not so in Sweden. Hmm. So I would argue, and I think many, many people would agree, that the good will and the good intentions uh, of the relatively open policies in Sweden that has, you know, by per capita, the highest rates, right, of, of, of immigrants in, in, the United, in, in Europe right now, uh, this is out of whack, right, with the labor market. And this is very different from the high rates of, of immigration that we saw in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s in a context of a demand for labor. So I think that the marks are right now are, are, are fairly low, and it's a pretty serious situation over the me medium term. Hmm. Let me go to Josef first, and then Fezi on the German situation. Uh, Josef, what can you tell us about how well new Muslim immigrant communities are adapting to life in Germany and being embraced by the broader population. Let me stress what Lars just said. Um, if you take Canada or the United States, countries of immigration, the bulk of immigrants came you know, in the 19th and early 20th century when there was land to be had and which were both were agrarian societies. 
So they would spread out across the country all the way to the Pacific. And inside the country, uh, 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 the industrial age provided a lot of plenty, plenty of plenty of jobs for untrained people. You could train them very quickly so that it could make a good wage, say, in Detroit, uh, in the car factories. These jobs uh, are to have disappeared. I mean, there's only 2% in Europe is still engaged in, in agriculture. And so you have all over Europe, you have vast open spaces. I mean, France and Eastern Germany are depopulating. Nobody wants to go there because there are no jobs there. Add finally a statistic which isn't which isn't you know uh, uh, a 24 karat gold. They're just kind of um, uh, very very informal polling of, of the refugees. About only about 10 12 percent of them have a university degree, and only one third of the young have a kind of completed vocational training. So the people c coming in are not ideally prepared for this. You know, the economy as Lars described it, the modern, modern economy. These are things, problems that are going to face us down the road. Um, for the time being, and I assume it's the same in Sweden as in Germany, there's a very generous welfare state which pays, which shelters people, which gives them food and clothes and furniture, plus an enormous wave of individual giving. Um, you know, every company I know of my own newspaper has a, has, has a room where you can deliver um, uh, clothes and, and, and other items. So we are talking about a long, uh, longer run problem. And you've asked me to come back to the Muslim community in Germany. Well, we've had a very a large one uh, for decades, and those were the Turkish guest workers. And again, the I don't have good numbers here. Uh, but it looks like the, the, the typical immigrant dream, you know, take, take the United States, take New York, you start out in the Lower East Side, your father goes to, goes to Midtown and uh, City College of New York, and the son and the next one goes to Harvard. Um, that, that, that American dream or Canadian dream is, doesn't seem to be working. Again, very anecdotal, I'm, 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 I'm stressing that in the Turkish community, where you see second and third generation doing less well than the, the parents. So the father came in, you worked at a car factory at good wages. The kids may have maybe dro school dropouts and they're driving taxis. Um, so, but one last point, in Germany, I assume also in Sweden, we are doing a lot better than say in France, where for generations African Arab immigrants have been penned up in the banlieue with apparently no real way out. Hmm. But to conclude, it's a, it's a very open question. How are we going to deal with this in the longer run? Faisi, could you add to that as to whether or not the pushback you're seeing against these migrants is more an anti-immigrant thing or more an anti-Muslim thing? Well, I, mean, I think we need to make a uh, differentiate two things here. The one is the, uh, the overall question of integrating newcomers into European societies. And the second one is that the impact of this flow on the European societies, this, this particular refugee crisis. And again, to put it into perspective, the majority of this refugee crisis, uh, the, you know, the, the consequences of this refugee crisis is borne by the regional countries. So compared to that, the Europe is actually only taking a very few of the refugees, the four million of them are in Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon. And right now it's around you know, 400,000, the, the latest numbers in Europe. So compared to when you look at from Turkey. OK, but compared uh, to Saudi Arabia, how many are they taking? Well, the thing is that Saudi Arabia Zero. is not taking anything. But right. if the question is that whether the regional countries are dealing with this, basically they're the ones that are dealing with this. Some of the regional you know, countries. Th that's right. And four million of them are there. OK. So when you look at from Turkey, for instance, people have a hard time understanding that while they took two million people in less than a year, a continent of half a billion people is having a hard time accepting 800,000 people or a million people. So what kind of an impact that's going to have on the labor market, right? I think the numbers tell us a different uh, story. 
But more importantly, I think, is the Europe's capacity uh, to integrate newcomers into its populations. But that's a larger question, and that's an ongoing question. And again, without going too far, but I would slightly differ from uh, Professor Yofe's uh, analysis of the third generation Turkish community in Germany, for instance, because I have done research on third generation uh, German, uh, Turkish Germans. That's your they're background not, too, isn't that's it? That's right, yeah. that's right, yes. And they're not, of course, they're never called uh, Turkish Germans because they don't hyphenate them over there as we do in Canada. And, uh, but the thing is that, I mean, when you talk to them, many of these third generation, is that they still complain that they're called outsiders and foreigners. So, uh, you know, in Canada, for instance, we don't call, you know, second or third generation immigrant kids as outsiders. But in Germany, there are, you know, all sorts of official terms to designate them. So, you know, it goes both ways. And Germany, France, and I think they're having a, a difficulty accepting the idea of having different people living in the midst of them as, as they are, but that's a larger question. In our remaining moments here, I'm going to read something from Simon Schama in the Financial Times of just the other day. Uh, Ivan Krasyev, I'll get you to respond to this first, and you tell me whether you think Simon is appropriately framing the issue the way he does. Our world, he writes, is facing three overwhelming problems. There is the relentless degradation of the planet's ecosystem, then the monstrous, ever-widening inequality between rich and poor. And then there is the big one, which those of us born at the end of the Second World War did not see coming, and which has proved intractably murderous. It is the division between those who want to live with people who look and sound pretty much like themselves, and those who think differences of skin color, faith, language are no bar to sharing the neighborhood, provided that newcomers subscribe to the same tolerant principles which brought them there in the first place. Yvonne, what do you think of the framing of that issue? No, I do believe that, of course, he's touching on something real, but let's give you just slightly more nuance. There are around 10% Bulgarian Turks, basically Muslims, living in Bulgaria. If you see their attitude towards basically the refugees coming from Syria, it's not much different than Bulgarian population as a whole. So from this point of view, I don't believe that it is simply kind of a religious divide mm -hmm. or even ethnic divide. We're talking about, in my view, something even bigger. Uh, the open borders and globalization was perceived as a huge promise for all these societies. And now we start to see also the dark side of it. And if till yesterday, the basic question was how to manage globalization. I do believe that now Europe is facing a problem how to manage a backlash against globalization. And in a small countries without colonial history, with very kind of a strong ethnic definitions of nations, like most of our East European countries are, these problems, of course, are much more severe, also on the level of cultural perceptions, political perceptions. And this is going to be a difficult period, because I agree very much. It's going to be uh, very difficult also to sustain different type of solidarities, because many people are saying we are seeing uh, the lack of solidarity in Europe, uh, in Eastern Europe. When you talk to many of the East Europeans, they're going to tell you we're seeing a clash of solidarity. We basically try to stay in the solidarity of our own nation, because otherwise we believe that basically we're going to disappear. Lars, how much of this is about people not wanting to welcome in people who don't look and sound and act like them? Um, I, I don't think, in Sweden at least, the issues are so much about things like, like race and, and ethnicity, but it is about values. I mean, Sweden is a society that is characterized by a great deal of emphasis on values like gender equality. It's a very individualistic country. And everybody's expected to work. The Swedish social contract is very straightforward. Everybody works, pay taxes, and then you acquire social rights. Uh, now, if you're outside of that, uh, if you are, have a more conservative view of the family, of uh, the role of women, if you do not work, uh, then you tend to be outside. That is really uh, the problem, uh, not race or religion or ethnicity per se. Josef Joffi, I'm down to my last minute here, and I want to ask you, do you think Germans should be more like Canadians? Well, first of all, German idea of nationality is ethnic. It also used to be religious. Uh, when I grew up in, in a big city like Berlin, uh, they were only, I was surrounded only by fair-haired uh, fair and fair-skinned fair people, and to see uh, a black was already quite surprising. And that, I can, I can report, has changed. If you 
take a Berlin subway these days, it looks almost like a New York or Washington DC or maybe Toronto subway. I would stress, uh, so I think the idea of ethnically blood-based nationality is fading as it is in, in Sweden. And I think it is correct to say that um, once you work, you're part of the social contract. But as I said before, I'm not too sanguine about, uh, about finding enough work for the newcomers, given the, the way our, our, our economies are structured. I, as to, if you look at all of Europe, you know, from way above from, from space, the problem is that with the exception perhaps of Germany and Switzerland, uh, the European economy is a declining economy. It hasn't, you know, its growth rate over the last four or five decades has gone down a half a point per decade. And we are now at, we are kind of stagnating. And so that's another variable to keep in mind. I think uh, Munich is doing beautifully uh, absorbing immigrants. It has a population, a foreign, foreign, foreign born population of almost 30, uh, 40% is doing so well because there's no unemployment here. It's a very rich city. And, it, and the city and jobs go begging. But un, unfortunately, not, not all of Europe is as privileged as Europe, as Munich is. Understood. Gentlemen, I thank all four of you for participating in our discussion tonight. Josef Joffe on Skype from Hamburg, Lars Tregord in London, UK, Ivan Krasyev in New York City, Fezi Baban here in our studios in Toronto. Thank you all very much. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.